Shalom Chavarim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Danoon Institute of Biblical Research, and I'm trusting that this is going to be a blessing for you guys today. We're going to be speaking about redemption. Uh, and I really think that my Jewish brothers and sisters all around the world definitely, uh, if you do not know who the Mashiach is, this is a message I think you should really take the time to look at. We are going to be looking at this from a uh, biblical point from where what went wrong in the Garden of Eden all the way down uh, through the time of Moses, the children of Israel in the wilderness journey, and then culminating up into uh, what happened 2,000 years ago. And what does it take to bring a restoration to what we lost, what our forefathers forfeited in the Garden of Eden? So without any further ado, let's get right into this. A little bit of a lengthy message, and I don't want to waste too much of your time in doing so. A little bit hot with all the lights we got going on in here right now, but uh, that we have to put a lot more lights on when we're dealing with a white screen here because it just makes the camera, makes it easier for the camera to pick us up as well as the, uh, the screen here. Anyway, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. This is in Genesis chapter 2, starting with verse 16. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not uh, good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. And out of the ground uh, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto the man to see what he would call them. And whatsoever the man would call every living creature, that was what the name there, uh, that, that would be the name thereof. And the man gave names to all the cattle and all the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helpmeet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the place with the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, a couple little things I want to hit here before I get into what Adam and Eve were before the actual fall, what they had, what they had that we didn't get for thousands of years later uh, after it was forfeited in the Garden of Eden there. And that was, God makes this very interesting statement here that the man was, uh, he, you know, was alone and it was not good for him to dwell alone. So God says to him, I'm going to make a help meet for him. That's the way we translate that in English. I think King James Version translates it the same way. Ezer kanegido. But the problem is, is in the biblical narrative throughout our Bible, the word Ezer or Ezra is referred to more often to our Heavenly Father than it is to Eve in this case here in this chapter, chapter 2. And nowhere does Eve become, or in this case where God, where it speaks of God being the Ezer or the Ezra, he is never referred to in a negative connotation as he is subservient to us. Right? No, of course not. Wouldn't, wouldn't make sense, would it? So in this case here, where God says he's making a helper for him, it actually says, Oselo uh, Ezer. Okay, so for him is made a helper, Kanigido, one that is an against him. One that is not so much, you could translate it as a compliment. I know some scholars call it a compliment, but it is actually to push. And what that means when we say kanigido in Hebrew there is to help balance out the, me the marriage there, to keep them both in that straight and narrow way. And I thought that was kind of a beautiful idea right there. But as you go down though further, and when after Adam comes out of this deep sleep that he is in, uh, and there is debate over whether or not it's actual a rib or the entire side of Adam where God forms this other part of, uh, uh, to make this woman, but that's not what we're going to focus on. What we're going to focus on is what Adam actually calls her, and he says here, and, uh, and the rib which the Lord God had made, taken from the man, made he a woman, and he brought her unto him, and the man said, this is now ha'adam, ve'yomer ha'adam, zot ha'pa'am atzam, me Atzamaya, okay, 
Ubasar, okay, and flesh mi basar, of my flesh, basari, excuse me, basari. All right, but then he says here, la zot ikara isha. He calls her isha. Now, isha is spelled aleph, sheen, he. But what's ironic about this beautiful name that Isha is called, or Eve is called in the beginning, Isha, is the fact that it's made up of two words here. It's actually made up of the word Ash, fire, and only the second letter to what most people call the divine name, or the word God in Hebrew. Adam, what he is called when he says it's taken from, see, Ik lazot ikara Isha, Ki me'esh la kach zot, kach zot. All right, because why she was taken from Ish, which is the man. And in the middle of that man's name, Ish, is a yod. The yod and the he were once together when they were one being. When they were one being before they were separated one from the other, it was God that dwelt in between them. And the Aish, the Aleph and the Sheen, the two letters that make up Ish and Isha, represented the fire. The fire of what? The fire of God. The spirit of the eternal Father God was dwelling inside of Adam and Eve when they were one. And when they were separated into two beings there, that still, that fire was still there in both of them. And God, yod He was now separated into two and living in two beings instead of one being. And I think it's an incredible insight to know. It's one reason why I say, what was Adam and Eve before the fall? They were creatures of light. Now, some people get that kind of mixed up when I speak about that and it makes them think that I'm thinking about somebody just floating around that's just a light being. Not exactly that. The point being is that they were filled with light. They were clothed in the glory of the Father God Himself, clothed in His glory. Did they have a body of flesh? Well, I guess to some extent, yes, but perhaps a little different than what we anticipate that that would be. And we see this because in Genesis chapter 3, when the fall actually comes, we see that God clothes them in skins. And of course, that skin that He clothes them in is not an animal skin as some perceive that to be. It's literally Literally, the Hebrew terminology is like a naked skin, like what we have in our own flesh. We're not hairy beings per se, right? But let's look at what happens in Genesis chapter 3 when the fall comes itself. And the eyes of them both were open because the serpent has come. He's offered uh, Eve this fruit. She partakes of the fruit. Then she goes to her husband, gives to him. He partakes of the fruit. And now their eyes are both are open. They realize they're naked. They sew fig leaves together. They're hiding now. And God comes down in the cool of the evening and looks for them. And when he's coming along, he begins to call out to them. And they've hid themselves, all right? And the eyes of them both were open. They knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made up themselves girls. And, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden toward the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto the man and said unto him, Where are you? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that you've done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, cursed art thou from among all the cattle, and from among all the beasts of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity, hatred, between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. They shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said. Now some might think that that should say his heel. It literally in the Hebrew is their heel. All right, and I think that's because of a compound fulfillment in Scripture. So keep that in mind. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy pain. 
and in thy travail, in pain, thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And because of that scripture right there, every woman feels like that they're subjugated to their husbands. Not to mention all the mistranslations they use of Paul. We'll go into that in a moment. And to Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and toil thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field, and the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and to dust shalt thou return. And the man called his wife's name Eve, or Chava, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made Adam, and for his, uh, excuse me, and, and the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become one of us to know good and evil. Now lest he put forth his hand to the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore God sent him forth from the garden to till the ground from hence he was taken. Now, quickly we'll take a look at this issue about the garment itself. Right here, see, right here, you, excuse me, right here. Katanot or la ve la beshim. Labeshim is the garment. That's literally the word for a garment right here. But it's this right here, the tanot, or the tanu, you might call it here. This is the word for skins here, but it's more like a naked skin. And this word right here, ein vav reish, is not the word light as you would think it would be. But in this case here, it is like being in darkness. They were clothed in darkness now. They were clothed in the skin. In other words, now their bodies that they had was no longer illuminating the spirit or the life of God because they had sinned. All right, now let's go back up to verse 16 and it'll begin to make more sense. And we have to understand this. If you're ever going to understand why there is redemption, you've got to go back and look at what happened in the beginning. Because redemption is to bring you back, right? So you have to understand. So unto the woman he said, all right, I will greatly multiply thy pain and thy sorrow, and in pain thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over, over thee or over you. Totally mistranslated. It's probably one of the worst translations in the Bible I've ever set, seen. El Haisha Omer, all right, to the woman. It doesn't say he said. It says to the woman is said. The word is would have to be injected here because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an article that we do not use in Hebrew, but we do not have the letter Yod here in front of Omer, so it's not to the woman he said. That's completely false right there. That's implying that God said it himself, but it's not. To the woman is said or was said, okay? Harabe araba or arabe, all right? Greatly or the great liar. Believe it or not, the word is liar. The great liar, okay, itzanosunecha ve haranecha be itzav. All right, what is he saying here? He's saying the great liar has said that you will have much sadness. And then you would do what? You will bring forth children, taladai banim. You will birth not just children, but you're going to birth sons. All right? So when God is saying that, he's literally telling you that it was said to the woman by the great liar that you're going to have great sadness and sorrow. And it's nothing to do with childbirthing and pain either. But he's literally, he was prophesying to the woman that you're going to bring forth sons. And that it will cause her to have great sadness is literally what it's saying right there. Then he goes on and says a little bit more besides that. Ve'el ishach, ishach, okay, and to your man, so to speak, or your husband, it doesn't say, it doesn't say here, your desire shall be to him. It literally says, to shutecha, you will turn to him. Why? 
Because the woman now has lost her direct contact with God. The Spirit of God, the Aish of Yah, the fire of God, the Holy Spirit is no longer there. They are now clothed in a skin of darkness. All right? They're no longer filled with the light and the fire of Almighty God inside of their bodies. Now they are clothed in that dark this, that dark skin there that's on them that is no longer illuminated with the spirit of a mighty God. And as a result, just as the serpent says, you're going to, as it says here, El Haisha Omer, God is saying that that was said to the woman, that great liar, that you're going to have great sadness and you're going to bring forth sons and, and great sadness and sorrow. Now that prophecy is true because what happened? She bears Cain and Abel and Cain gets mad at Abel and murders Abel. So she's got great sadness for one and great sorrow for the other one. All right? So she does have sons. It does cause her sadness and sorrow. And what does she do? She turns to her, what? To her husband. And it says here, Vehu i mashal becha. And he will rule over you. Why? He doesn't have God either. There's no Holy Spirit in him anymore because as the woman, he too loses the Spirit of God, that fire of God that was dwelling inside of him. And so now he is a fallen son of God. She is a fallen daughter of God. Neither one of them having the Spirit of God now and in a fallen state clothed in darkness now, Oh my gosh, friends, it's amazing to me. She, because she doesn't have that strength of Almighty God to turn to, now she turns to the closest thing to her. They reminded her of God, who was made in the image of God, her husband. Of course, she is too. Because remember, when it, he was made in the image of God, what was that? Before the fall. Before the separating of their beings. So, in the image of God, when he created them, remember the word, them, he created them, male and female, see, God is everything. He's both, what do we sing the song? He's our father, our mother, our brother, our sister. God is everything, right? All right then, so he's both masculine and feminine. When he put out the Holy Spirit to come on upon us, it was so that we could unite with him. All right? That's what the Holy Spirit is for, is to bring back that fire of Almighty God to unite us back to Him. Now, I want to prove something to you, because some people might say, wait a minute, that word right there, when you look in the Hebrew there, uh, that uh, haraba, harabe, that means greatly multiply. Well, yeah, if you want to do it that way, you can, but ar arab, which is the, the root right here, arab, let me share with you from Judges. You can also find it in the book of Lamentations as well. But it's also translated as liar or a liar in wait. All right? It says right here, uh, right here, verse 9, Judges chapter 16. Now she had liars in wait abiding in the inner chamber. Really, liars in wait. Ve ha arav. Yoshev lach becheder. They were they were liars waiting in the inner room. They were waiting in her room, sitting in her room. However you want to put it. But here's the alaf reish bet arav. So the great liar, liars in wait is a way you can put it. All right. So in this case here, God is saying that the serpent was the great liar in wait. Okay, this is what Yahweh is calling this, or calling him. Now, let's move on. i got to share something here with you as well, just so you can make sense. Because I, I mentioned to you that she turns to her husband, right? And he rules over her. Why is he ruling over her? That's not God's divine plan. God's divine plan is that they're equal together. And that she was Ezra Kanegido to help press the relationship to keep them on the straight and narrow way. They were partners. 
You left your father, your mother, you cleave to your wife. You become what? One flesh. God again, remember, He is Ezra as well, or Ezer. He is our helper. Does that make God that He's our lower guy and we, we tell Him what to do? I mean, think about it, brethren. Now, I know there's some people say, you know, well, Paul said, I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority, for it's not forbidden for her to speak in the church of, the, of God. You know what? You see one side of the letter and never see the other side of the letter. And if you go back to the original coin of Greek, he doesn't say, I suffer not a woman to teach. He said, I suffer not that woman to teach nor to usurp authority because why that woman come in trying to bring in the doctrine of diana which was nothing but a, a a sex cultish idea that the men were to go sleep with the prostitutes of diana and come back and then they could have they could they would be safe and bearing their children that was a cultish idea that was being taught during the times of paul they were going around saying that oh no your husband your husband's got to sleep over here with the goddess dianas and all these little prostitutes over here that's the only way that's why paul said uh, think about it. I mean, think of the logic of this right now, right? Paul says, you shall be safe in childbearing, saved in childbearing. Do you really think that childbearing saves a woman? Do you think that childbearing brings about salvation? No, it doesn't. If you look at the Greek word that is actually there, Paul doesn't say you will be saved in childbearing, but he says you will be safe. S-A-F-E in childbearing because why he was dealing with the woman that brought in the doctrine of Diana that was saying that these men had to go and sleep with these prostitutes and if they didn't sleep with the prostitutes their babies would die with their own wives and so they were supposed to go donate to the goddess Diana in order to make sure their children their wives would be safe when they give birth to child a faultish cultish theology that was going on that Paul was trying to deal with and you just didn't know that all right, so this is how these doctrines get all twisted up, and it doesn't make sense because look at look at uh, Aquila and Priscilla. Paul calls them my helpers. We could go into a whole lot of other things, and, and this may not go over too well with some people. I'm sure I've taught on this for many years, guys. I've taught on it many years, but the Lord has been blessing with more revelation on this. So I, I'm trusted it'll be a blessing to you. All right, so we already established there the liar in wait there is, of course, is referring to the serpent. Now, 1 Corinthians, this is another good one. This is actually from Paul's words right here, too. Uh, now, he's talking about whether or not there should be a covering or not for a man and a woman. He says, neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. All right, for this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, now watch what he says, neither is the man without the woman and neither the woman without the man in the Lord. There's your equality right there. But do you realize what he's talking about? It's just like when they talk about they have the headship doctrine. Oh, there's no ship to the head. All right, let's face it. When they talk about, I, I forget exactly where that is in Scripture, where it talks about, you know, the, the, the man is the head of the woman and the woman, uh, and, and, they, and they break it down. And, they, and, and churches like to use this in the pulpits as well, saying, well, your pastor is over the church, and your husband is under the pastor, and then the pastor, the woman is under her husband, and then the children, they do this all in this chronological uh, hierarchy type of relationship, so to speak, then. And I've seen such false doctrines come out of this, that pastors going around saying that they're the spiritual husband to the woman and then you end up with all kinds of fornication and everything else that goes on it really turns into a major mess but to straighten this out when Paul speaks about that that the man is the, or the, or that God is the head of Christ and Christ is the head of the man and man is the head of the woman it is strictly speaking in the word there kephale in the Greek language means source not hierarchy in other words the father the eternal father God he begot Yeshua, the only begotten Son of God, was Yeshua. And the man was created by Yeshua in the very beginning, so his source is Christ. And the woman come out of that man, Eve in that case, so the man was the source. And then Paul says, nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, speaking of Yeshua himself. In other words, not only did Christ create Adam and Eve come out of Adam, but also Christ come back out of what? Mary. And so neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. So that's all dealing with the way God created everything. 
So it goes back to what we're talking about in this redemption here. Redemption is so great, friends. It is bringing us back to one. Remember, Christ says that I am in the Father, the Father is in me, and you are in me, and I am in you. It's got to be both ways. See, it's got to bring back redemption is what we have to bring back. All right? So now let's jump all the way over to John chapter 4 here. There cometh the woman of Samaria. Mm, I'm getting excited here. To draw water. And Jesus saying unto her, give me to drink. This is going to be your first look at that redemption being restored. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. And then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew ask me, asketh drink of me, which of a, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that, that saith it to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. And the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have, had, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast said well, and I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband, and that thou sayest truly. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, you say in Jerusalem, is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. And so He could say the, say the salvation was of the Jews already because it came to the Jews first. The house of Israel was already in uh, dispersion. And of course, Samaritans are the children of the house of Israel that intermarried in amongst the Arabic community when they left. He said, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So you've got to go back to what? Ish and Isha, the fire of Almighty God dwelling within you. The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah comes, when he, which is called Christ, and when He has come, He will tell us all things. He's supposed to restore all things, isn't He? Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am He. And upon this came his disciples, and the woman marveled and talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest with that woman? The woman then left her water pot, went in her way, and ran in the city, and saith unto the men, Come see a man which told me everything I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Friends, let me tell you something. Besides the fact of what he did to get her attention, he was giving her a sign. He said, I'd give you water, you don't come here no more. Do you know what sign he was giving her? A sign that Israel, the Jewish people of 2,000 years ago, and the Israelites of today, those living in Israel, those of the house of Israel that are blind in dogmas and creeds and every kind of false doctrine, should be waking up to recognize. Let me show you the sign that he's talking about. If you go back to Exodus chapter 17, when Moses says here, and Moses cried to the Lord saying, What shall I do unto this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pass on before the people, and take with you the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, and take in thy hand, and go, behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb. And thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of all the elders of Israel. 
And the name of the place was called Masa Mirabah because of the striving of the children of Israel because they tried the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? In other words, do we have the Holy Spirit or don't we have the Holy Spirit? Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men and go and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Now, just stopping right there. They were thirsting to death before this battle came up. They were dying of thirst. All right, this is also a type two before the battle comes on, when you're dying of thirst, when you know you don't have the spirit of almighty God, what did Moses do? God said, take the elders of Israel, just like 2,000 years ago, when what? When the high priest came and they brought the elders of Israel and they judged the rock that sat before them, which was Christ Jesus, right? They did. What did the elders of Israel do? The high priest, he gathered up the elders of Israel. They brought Yeshua in. They falsely accused him like they're falsely accusing Moses. And they brought him up and they set him down and they brought two false witnesses to bear witness against him. And Moses had the whole congregation against him. So he brought the elders of Israel up. They judged the rock that was in front of them. And when Moses smote that rock, that water come forth. When that water come forth, it was life giving waters to the children of Israel. It was the waters of life. The the the. Uh, Chaim. It was truly that life, the Maim Chaim, the water of life coming out. And if they didn't drink, they would die. All right? Now, but it was a sign foreshadowing the coming of the Mashiach because that rock was the same rock that is God says to Moses in Numbers chapter 20, speak to the rock that it bring forth its waters. Why? Because Christ was to be smitten once. The rock was to be smitten only once. But instead, Moses got angry because of the, of the hardness of the heart of the people. And in anger, he smote the rock. It brought forth its waters, but he wasn't supposed to smite it. And he smote it twice. And so when Christ came, it was foreshadowing, showing it with Moses that the children of Israel, the elders of Israel, would judge the rock. Hatsur, the rock, which is Christ. And when he was on the cross and he gave that woman at the well a sign, if you knew who it was, it was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink and I'd give you water. You don't come here no more. Right? It's what he said. And when she took, when she, I believe she was there the day when they smote him. And when that Roman soldier drove that spear into his side, what came out? Blood and water. The blood was the atonement. Blood was shed. But the water, what was what was important? It was the waters of life coming out of him. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm going to prove this to you. Psalm chapter 78. I just saw this day, never knew it before. All right. David saw it. Watch what he says. Yea, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that waters gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Or will he provide flesh for his people? Did you ever see that one? Let me read it to you again. Yea, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? What did Yeshua sit at? He sat at the table, didn't he, with his disciples. Behold, he smote the rock. Israel smote the rock, Christ Jesus. That waters gushed out. And when the Roman soldier pierced his side, let me tell you something. Just like God said about Titus when he came against, uh, uh, he speaks over there in Obadiah, and he says, you were as one of them when they destroyed the temple. The Romans were as one of them. So Israel then is one of them when they allowed the Romans to put Yeshua to death. They are as one of them complicit in his death. See? And my brother, listen to me. Don't hate the Jews for it because had they not done it, you wouldn't have no life. Understand that? Same thing with Joseph. Joseph said to his brothers, don't be angry with yourself. If you didn't sell me out, you'd all be dead. God did it to preserve life. And the same with the Jews today or 2,000 years ago that sold out Christ. They did it to preserve your life. Don't be angry with them. And so what does he say right here? He says, He smote the rock that waters gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he bring bread also? The bread of life? Christ! Or will he provide flesh for his people? He 
became flesh. My God, my Jewish rabbis, don't you see it? You say God can't be a man. God, God can be whatever he wants to be. And he says here, will he provide flesh for his people? He did. He put him in a temple of flesh, brought him down here. You judged him. You smote him. And the water gushed out as a sign to Israel. And how can you miss it? How can you miss it? Right there before your own eyes and everything. And then we sit there and we wonder about Zechariah chapter 12. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace of supplication. And they shall look upon me uh, upon, uh, unto me because they have thrust him through. All right. Where we got it right here? Thrust him through. <laughs> and it's literally in Hebrew. The word for thrust through. Now we look and we say, we translate it in King James as pierced, but it's thrust through. It's when the Roman soldier drove that spear in his side. Zechariah holds Israel guilty. Complicit. Why? You just turned the man over. Didn't even Jesus say himself and everything? He says that if a man thinks it in his own heart to kill a man, he's guilty of murder just the same. He was letting them know. Do you realize that he was prophesying of his own people? He said, Moses, it says in the law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's one of them. But you take that, thou shalt not kill. And Yeshua says, if you're angry with your brother in your heart without a cause, you're guilty of murder. Why do you think Zechariah prophesies then that they're guilty as well? But they had to do it. Don't forget that they had to do it in order to bring forth life for all of us. So when the house of Judah, when they offered up and they brought the elders of Israel and they judged Yeshua, they judged the rock. And then they smote the rock that it bring forth its waters. They had to do it. They had to offer that sacrifice for sin. And his blood atoned. You know, in the book of Adam and Eve, God says to Adam when he offers blood the first time, he offered his own blood, and he says, I never required that of you. He said, but I will come, and I will lay down my own life. Psalm says that he's able to provide flesh. He wasn't talking about eating of the quail. He was, talk, he was prophesying of the coming of Mashiach. But it says right here, In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadramon in the valley of Megiddon. And the land shall mourn every family apart and the family of the house of David apart and their wives apart and the family of the house of Nathan apart and their wives apart. They're both from the tribe of Judah. The family of the house of Levi apart and their wives apart. The priest. The family of Shemites apart and their wives apart. Or literally, Shemai. Hmm. And it doesn't say Shemites. It says Hashemai. The family of Shemai. You know why it says Shemai? Because the story of David. Remember when David goes out? God puts the Shemites there. That's the tribe of Benjamin, by the way. You know why he does that? He does that as a memorial to the children of Israel. David was a perfect type of Yeshua, a perfect type of Christ. He crosses the, the Kidron Valley. He weeps over Jerusalem as Yeshua wept over Jerusalem. He goes out, Shemai spitting on his face, and his soldiers wanting to deal with him said that that dog's head stay on him and David said let him alone the Lord told him to do it and it was Shemai the Benjamites that were spitting in the face of Jesus when he was here but who was it that met him back down at the river when David was coming home and don't forget about Absalom his own son does not recognize that David is anointed of his position he doesn't even recognize it doesn't recognize his father as the king of Israel. So when David leaves, he leaves ten concubines behind. Says, care for my house in my absence. There's your, there's your ten virgins. Five foolish, five wise. Abused by the children of Israel because they don't recognize Yeshua to be the Mashiach. But when David is returning, who meets him? Shammai, the Benjamite. First one to repent. Think about it. 
all the families that remain, every part and their wives apart. There's your Samaritans. They've stayed in the land. And let me tell you something. They say that Palestinians have Jewish DNA in them. I wouldn't doubt some of them do. I really wouldn't. Because if they're originally from Jordan or the ancient kingdom of Assyria, they may be part of the house of Israel as well. Don't be so negative to your brother. Remember, we were taught in the law, do unto others as you would them do unto you. We can't forget that. But here's your redemption. What happened when Yeshua died on the cross and that water came out? His life left his body. That life that come out of Christ was the fire of Almighty God. What happened on the day of Pentecost when they were gathered there in the upper room and they were all praying in one mind and one accord? The scripture speaks about there were cloven tongues as of fire. As of fire that came down and rested upon each one of them. I remember seeing a painting one time showing like a, like a, a little flame of fire above each one of them. Do you know in the Greek language it's saying it's like a fire. And then, of course, they staggered out of the house. Every man heard in his own language. Really, the miracle was they heard in their own language. But the point was, is what came down on the day of Pentecost? It was the fire, the very thing that Adam and Eve first had that they lost. Ish and Isha, the fire of God that was indwelling inside of them that made them light, children of the light. I think that's a biblical statement as well. Yeshua says you're a light set on a hill. You don't hide it under a bushel. So let your sh light shine before man. Why? Because when you are filled with the Spirit of Almighty God, it is the fire of God in you. That is what Yeshua did. He came and He died. And he released the life that was in him so that that Spirit of God could come back upon us. It was the Spirit of God that unites us with him. And without that life of God in us, you cannot be united with your mate. You cannot be, Adam and Eve cannot be united without that Spirit of life within them. That's what makes them one. That's what makes us one with him. That's why Jesus said, in that day you will know that I am in the Father, the Father is in me, and I am in you, and you are in me. That's redemption. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Institute of Biblical Research. Eric.